The following episode can be viewed on the YouTube channel Bernie or Bust Television. Good morning, USA, and welcome to another episode of the Bernie or Bust Show. Democrats pretend to oppose Iran attack they enabled. Really gave a shit that Democrats could have stopped Trump from doing this. They don't want to stop Trump from doing this. This is a, uh, this is two, uh, we have foreign policy, two parties with one policy, and that's more war, more war. As, uh, th that, I mean, is this, do you need any more proof than this, Max, that they, did, they don't care that Trump did this, that they actually do support him, which is why he knew he could get away with this, which is why he did it? Well, Nancy Pelosi, this is probably stating the obvious, but Nancy Pelosi also totally against all those amendments. She, oh, she was against all those amendments? Yes. yes. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So so we had amendments, Tulsi Gabbard, Ro Khanna, one other at least, that that um, would prevent war with Iran specifically, and they showed those in detail. We're already 9 minutes and 54 seconds into this clip, so you'll, you'll need to go back and watch it if you want to see those. But those provisions are, are were proposed to prevent exactly what has happened with with um, Donald Trump escalating things in Iran. Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, all of the imperialist Democrats, they all want war with Iran and with Russia and with Syria. It's really good for business. So that's what he's saying here is Nancy Pelosi voted to strike these amendments that would have prevented war with Iran. So if, if the Democrats really wanted to oppose Trump, they would have been for those amendments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're not. They're not really f against him. They're, while they're trying to impeach him, they're, <laughs> like, they're giving him the power to do this. So that just goes to show you that this is a phony conversation that we're having about the Iran war once again. And it will be led by Rachel Maddow. It will be led by Jake Tapper. And it will be uh, led by anybody over at Fox News, too. Well, I'm curious to see what Tucker Carlson says about this, because he stuck his chin out on the Iran situation a lot. So I haven't seen his coverage of this yet. Maybe is he on vacation or something? But I would really be curious because... He's the only person in mainstream news that will tell the truth about Iran. And so shame on you, MSNBC, New York Times, Washington. Of course, they're all garbage. The, the, the journalism community in America is nothing but garbage, herd mentality, fucking climbers. Because there's a story out there to be written, and it's going to win you a Pulitzer Prize. And it's about how the intelligence community ginned up fucking Russiagate, distracted the entire country, and now everybody's going along with this. But that fucking story will never get printed in a mainstream news magazine or, or outlet, ever. Okay? Which is why we're in fucking seven wars, and now we're getting an eighth. And yep. nobody gives a shit. That's why. That's why Nira Tandon has to tweet about me and call me a conspiracy theorist because I'm onto her warmongering. She's for us invading more countries and stealing their oil. That's what Julian Assange revealed, which is why they want to kill Julian Assange, which is why this show won't be around much longer. Because they're coming for us. They're coming for Julian Assange, and they want this fucking war. And if we, if we can wake up anybody to stop this war, they will come for us. They already came for Max. They already fucking had SWAT teams surround his house, come inside of his house. They Max Blumenthal, they, they already arrested him. And then it was 20 hours, I think, that he was, that he was incarcerated. Said he was armed and dangerous, which means they could have dropped a bullet in him at any moment and anybody would have been okay with it. They would have found a gun in your house, too. So they're already it, it, coming. This has already happened. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that was because of a lie cooked up against me by the Venezuelan opposition, which didn't like the reporting that I was doing, exposing their drive for a war and an economic war on Venezuela. And this will be the year, 2020, when the whole war on alternative media just comes out into the open and they stop pretending. They've, you know, they went after RT and registered it as a foreign agent, but now they're going to start coming after independent media. And their trigger word is conspiracy theorist. Anything and, and really what that's code for is you're skeptical about the national security state, about the permanent war state. If you express skepticism and mobilize people in a meaningful way against the war state, you're a conspiracy theorist. And all the conspiracy theorists have been vindicated on Duma when a chemical attack was staged by the Syrian opposition and it was only 
It had to be Tucker Carlson as the lone voice in media. We had to go to the far right because on the left, you know, Chris Hayes, who came up with me at The Nation and Fake Yapper on CNN and Rachel <laughs> Maddow, they just they just take it hook, line and sinker that whatever the national security state says is true. They're a bunch of climber opportunists. And it's so sad that there's 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 simply no one on the center left who is willing to issue even a symbolic challenge. Um, you're right. We have been the victim, the American public, of an intelligence coup, and they've used mainstream corporate media as a platform. All right. So how do we feel about war? Do we agree with George Carlin? War is rich old men protecting their property by sending middle class and lower class men off to die. If that's true, then why are we like the liberals in Phil Oak's song? Yes, I read New Republic and Nation. I've learned to take every view. You know, I've memorized Lerner and Golden. I feel like I'm almost a Jew. But when it comes to times like Korea, there's no one more red, white, and blue. So love me, love me, love me. I'm a liberal. So these liberals, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and so forth, they're enabling war because of one thing. Their donors make money. Major U.S. arms companies have seen their stock prices jump following the Trump administration's assassination of Iranian military commander Qasem Soleimani. The U.S. announced it was deploying nearly 3,000 extra troops to the Middle East on Friday as Iran vowed severe revenge on those responsible for Soleimani's killing. Iran's expected retaliation means America's long-running military presence in Iraq and the Middle East, which has financially benefited U.S. defense companies, is unlikely to wind down. Defense technology company Northrop Grunman saw its stock up by 5.43% on Friday, while Lockheed Martin stock gained 3.6% and Raytheon stock rose by 1.5%. The killing of Soleimani, a powerful military commander, has sparked fears of an all-out war between the U.S. and Iran, which would lead to increased military spending. So are our liberal Democrats opposed to this war? No. No, because their donors are not opposed to it. Here is an interesting video on how this all works. East became another world trouble spot with the nationalization and seizure of the world's largest oil refinery in Abadan in Iran. Prices could double if Iran closes off the Strait of Hormuz. Further pictures from Tehran show rioters in action as anti-royalist partisans, supporters of the aged Dr. Masadik, set about their work of destruction. Regime change is the only way to save Mideast from just perpetual conflict. This regime needs to go. How do you overthrow a government? CIA sent its senior Middle East operative, a guy named Kermit Roosevelt, to Iran with the mandate, overthrow this government. Kermit Roosevelt arrived and immediately began passing money around. Within a very short time, he had more than half of Iran's newspapers on the CIA payroll. And then he hired a gang of street thugs to charge through the streets and beat up pedestrians and smash shop windows and shoot their guns into mosques and yell, we love Mossadegh and communism. And then he did something which was really smart. He actually hired a second street gang to attack the first street gang. <laughs> I wonder so how they the felt. streets of Tehran were in chaos and violence and upheaval. American headlines are humming with leaks from the White House warning that Iran is loading boats with ballistic missiles. The U.S. has ordered all of its military personnel out of the region. Its closest ally there, Saudi Arabia, is tweeting Tehran has launched drone attacks that it's time for the U.S. to strike first. And then there are those Saudi and Norwegian oil tankers mysteriously attacked mysteriously. in the Gulf. Mysteriously. Mysteriously. I see a three-part uh, process going on in most of these operations. A leader of a country like Mossadegh begins to interfere with the way foreign corporations operate in his country. 
the second thing that happens is that inside the foreign policy process, so inside the White House, if you want to put it that way, the motivation morphs. It changes. People look at someone like Mossadegh and they say, well, if he is bothering a giant corporation, the functioning of which is vital to our idea of the world economy, it must mean that he's anti-capitalist and he's anti-American and he's probably in league with our enemies. Therefore, we must overthrow him, but not because he's bothering these companies, only because his harassment of these companies proves that he must be our political enemy. I am so pleased that Pompeo made the Reagan speech toward Iran like Reagan made toward the Soviet Union. I am so pleased that President Trump is letting the Iranian president know there's a new sheriff in town. We're on the verge of history here. third stage comes after the operation is done. It's time now to explain to Americans and to the world why we did this. Then we abandon both of those first two reasons. We come up with a new reason that we never even mentioned when we were planning the coup, and that is we only did it to help the poor, suffering people in that country. In this battle, we have fought for the cause of liberty. Oh, yeah. And for the peace of the world. We did it to liberate them. They were being brutally oppressed, and we wanted to get rid of their oppressor as a gift to that nation. We did it to protect human rights. <laughs> as a gift to that nation. This is always the excuse that we come up with after we finish overthrowing a country for other reasons. The Trump administration finds its economic methods are not yielding the results that it wants. It's escalating its rhetoric because it's a very rhetorical administration. And, and now it's, a, it's, it's sort of stuck. And it um, talks to itself in ways that um, are very militaristic because that's the way Donald Trump likes to talk. But he doesn't like to match his talk to, to his thoughts. He doesn't like to match um, rhetoric to preparation. The Dulles brothers and the people who organized that coup had no idea of the concept that we now call blowback. The idea that bad things can happen over the long run when you intervene violently in other countries. So Right after the coup happened, it seemed like it was a great success. We got rid of a guy we didn't like, Mossadegh, and we put in someone else, the Shah, who would do everything we wanted. It seemed like the perfect outcome. And in fact, you could have continued to argue that the coup was a success for the next 25 years. But now, as we look back on it, it doesn't really look quite so successful. Because of the 1953 coup, the Shah came back to power, and he intensified his repression over a period of 25 years. That intensifying repression produced the explosion of the late 1970s that we now call the Islamic Revolution. That revolution led to the emergence of a fanatically anti-American regime that has spent decades working intently, and sometimes very violently, to undermine American and Western power all over the world. Religious fundamentalists there, as in other countries, realized we don't have to spend our whole lives chanting in the corner of mosques. We can go out and try to seize the reins of state power. Kambiz, thank you for that. Kambiz Khosravi. I'll link to this so you can find it yourself because it's worth watching again and again. So Raytheon, up. Lockheed Martin, up. Northrop Grumman, up. Any questions? Now this little episode of the Bernie or Bush show 
got some pushback. I had this photo up on my story on Facebook, and a few people didn't like it, and they were saying that it was inflammatory and needless, among other things. And I want to make the case that if you are voting for Joe Biden, you're voting for war. Now, if you think that war is um, not likely to touch you because you live in the middle of a big, strong country, that's not a good reason to send children into war just because their families like make less money than your family makes to, to make sure that Raytheon's stock keeps going up. It's, it's not a good reason. And so if, if I came across too strongly, I've, if I've said rich assholes for Biden and that offended you, we need to consider what's at stake. We're sending people to die to defend our economic interests. And our economic interests don't mean our economic interests. It means Raytheon. It means all of the people at the top, the 1%. The people that Bernie rails against are making money with prisons, they're making money with war, they're making money with pharmaceuticals, they're making money with health insurance, they're making money, and it's the same people making money in all those ways. So if you're in the middle class or the upper middle class and your plight has been okay, you're doing okay, your wages haven't gone up maybe, but they haven't gone down, and you're comfortable, you live in your nice house with your nice car, and your children go to their nice schools, and you feel that from Ronald Reagan on, you've been doing okay under the duopoly, the charade where Republicans and Democrats are all working for the same donors. If, if that's benefited you, then you can come across like this person who, who disagreed with me this morning or yesterday maybe, I put that picture up of Joe Biden, rich assholes for Biden, and this polite person said, why would you share something like this? And I said, a little context might help. And then I linked to this Bernie or Bus show. Who the fuck are these people keeping Joe Biden at the top of the polls? And then this person came back with, hmm, didn't help. And then I gave this person an article from Truthdig. Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg are not to be trusted. Lots of good information about why we, we should resist any kind of, of leadership from those two. And then I said, I guess the primary questions are, are you comfortable? Are you white? Do you actually want change that will benefit those less fortunate? particularly those being sent off to get their asses blown up in war. I didn't say that to this person. If so, voting for Biden is insupportable. My point is that people voting for Biden are seeking erroneously to maintain their privilege. What I meant by erroneously is that they won't, it won't work. The the, they're coming for everyone eventually. The cronies in the middle class and upper middle class eventually are going to realize when they don't have a planet, when their air is unbreathable, when their water is undrinkable, when they can't buy enough bottled water to keep up with, <laughs> because the trucks will stop running, because people will be piling into the street, people will be um, indiscriminate. But everyone should know that comfortable middle class and upper middle class voters are culpable in this battle. We've got a problem here. And we should keep in mind who's responsible for it, who's aiding and abetting these war criminals, who's aiding and abetting the criminals on Wall Street. But this is the answer. I want you to understand that this is not a good answer. I just happen to have a different point of view. I don't see things the same way you do, and I am informed. I appreciate your support for your candidate. It's just a horse race to this person. This person just believes that 
any candidate as good as any other candidate if, if you believe so. No, voting for Biden is not supportable. I laid out the case yesterday, and I put the article here, making supported points for how a vote for Biden can only come from a place of privilege and selfishness. I respect that you have a different opinion. I respect even more an argument that is supported and supportable. For example, if I said that Hitler was a bad dude or an asshole and backed up my argument with facts, and then someone else politely disagreed with no facts, that's what we would be looking at here. We can't simply disagree politely and think that our, our position is supportable. I appreciate it when people are both informed and willing to back up their points of view with that information, with any information. So we've got here a typical problem with, with Democrats is they, they want it to be a horse race. They want everyone to politely give the pros and the cons of their candidate. And the bottom line is it's trivial. It's trivial. It doesn't really matter who wins that much. I can still vote blue for your candidate. Why can't you do the same? Why can't you be as grown up as I am? And this is where we have to understand this is desperate. These are desperate times. We have people being killed, not us, not our children, because our children don't go to war. But war is rich old men protecting their property and their stock prices by sending middle class and lower class men and women off to die. It always has been. That's what it is. And if you vote for Biden or Buttigieg or Warren, if a vote for Biden, a vote for Warren, a vote for Buttigieg is a vote for war and economic inequality and economic insecurity for those lower down the economic ladder than you are, then you're an asshole. That's the point. I can support it. It's a supportable point. If you have something to say in opposition to that, other than my fifis are hurt, then please tell me. Tell me a supportable argument. Back it up with logic, with information, and then we'll go from there. Otherwise, my point stands. If you're voting for Biden, you're an asshole. Here are some episodes of the Bernie or Bust television show that you can use if, you're, if your point of view is similar to mine and you want information to back you up. We had Phil Oaks yesterday, Do Liberals Love War? Please go back and watch that if you get a chance. Beware the Sheepdog, that got some good comments. I covered viewer comments. Bernie versus Warren in swing states, if you want the argument why you can't vote for Elizabeth Warren. There are lots and lots of Bernie or Bush shows about why you shouldn't vote for Elizabeth Warren. I've been at this a while now. So please watch and please argue with information. The cruel blow that I received yesterday was, will Bernie voters vote for Biden when he wins? The annoying part is, it's difficult to make a case that Biden won't win because he's sitting at the top of the polls. One month out from the Iowa caucuses, the race for the Democratic nomination looks remarkably stable. Miraculously stable. You might even think the CIA is involved. Joe Biden is solidly in the lead. Bernie Sanders is roughly nine points behind him. Elizabeth Warren and Pete Buttigieg have faded. And Michael Bloomberg is blowing through wads of cash in order to stay inches ahead of Amy Klobuchar and Andrew Yang. The dynamics of the race have been consistent at the top for more than a year now. Will Sanders supporters be willing to hold their noses and turn out to vote in November for a card-carrying member of the Democratic Party establishment when the socialist to whom they're so passionately devoted falls short of victory? And there you have it. That's the Bernie or Bush pledge is, hell no, hell no, we're not going to vote for your corporatist. We're not going to vote for war. We're not going to vote for the military-industrial or the prison-industrial complex. We're not going to vote to keep the oligarchs in charge. Hell no. 
and they'll say, oh, you're so privileged. You don't understand, you don't smell the desperation, but you will when the people are piling into the streets. Now, if Jimmy Dore is right, and this show, the Bernie or Bus show, is perceived as a threat, then it will disappear. Jimmy's show will disappear. Max Blumenthal, Aaron Maté will disappear. Tim Black will disappear. Other, oh, Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty will disappear. And you'll know why. You'll know it's because the CIA and the military complex didn't like us because we were telling the truth about how the oligarch makes money off of us and off of the blood of other people, other people's children, people's children in Philadelphia and Baltimore who have terrible schools, but people's children in Iraq who aren't there anymore. And the blood is on all of our hands if we can support the democratic centrists, the corporatists. We have to come to our senses in time and we have to say, no, I'm not going to vote blue no matter who. That's anti-American, it's anti-patriotic, and it's dehumanizing, and it's inhumane, and it's inhuman. And we need to stop doing it. We need to put our foot down. We need to wake up. Get on board the Bernier bus train. Come get on board the Bernier bus train. Once you hear that clickety clack, there ain't no time for turning back. Get on board the Bernier bus train. The preceding episode can be viewed on the YouTube channel Bernie or Bust Television.